Rise of the First World War began back in 2014 and it's a centenary project running right the way through to 2019. The idea of it actually came from Imperial War Museum's own remit. So when we founded the museum back in 1917, the idea was to represent men and women from across Britain and the Commonwealth who were involved in the First World War. And that's continuing today. And what we wanted to do was bring it right up to date into the digital age and allow people to contribute to our website online. Working on Lives of the First World War, you get an understanding of how war touched the whole of the population. It wasn't purely the people on the Western Front. It was a worldwide war. It involved hundreds of thousands of people from many countries worldwide, from China, from the British colonies in Africa, from Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and so on and so forth. For me, what's lovely about this is remembering the ordinary people and developing their lives as much as we can. Just, to, just so that we have some understanding of our own history and we can put those days in context. So to me, um, being involved in lives of the First World War is a way of commemorating um, those who served in the war and also those whose lives were affected in other ways, so conscientious objectors, um, the families of those who served and who died. Um, and it's also a way of enabling other people to remember because where you've got just a name on a war memorial or just a name in a book, it doesn't really mean anything to people until you've got some story and some context. And as soon as you've got that story and that context, you can take it into a school and you can say, these men went to your school and this is what happened to them. You can go to people and say, this person was born on your birthday and they died in the First World War. It's nice to get that link uh, between people in as many ways as possible. You've got things like letters from the trenches, photos of sweethearts. But the great thing about Lives of the First World War is that you can digitise this content, you can put it online and you can share it with the rest of the world. Altogether I've worked on nearly three and a half thousand separate lives on Lives of the First World War. Some of those are to do with my family and that's really where I started. But when I became a volunteer I was asked to work on a number of other projects. When I was finishing off the details for one of my great uncles, I also decided to add information for the colleagues who died on the same day as he did. Things progressed thereafter and I've now got the details of over 3,000 men of the regiment that have been updated on Lives of the First World War. The the actual Battle of Jutland project, we've created about 2,500 new life stories for it. I think the surprises often come through communities because they allow us to see people in context. There are communities for men who suffered facial wounds or munitions workers who suffered TNT poisoning. Those are where the surprises come and the, and the communities can't possibly, in most cases, gather all of those people, but they give you a real sampling and you start to understand the war in a different way. It's the first time I've worked in something quite like this, where we've got volunteers who haven't met up face to face, but nevertheless collaborate in incredible detail. And not just on the life stories, but some of the communities, exchanging information between them. I think some of the biggest surprises for me have come through my connection with other uh, volunteers and other lives users who I'm in regular daily contact with, which is really lovely, um, really expands my knowledge base and, and just there's so many interesting things that come up that I wouldn't find otherwise. The lives of the First World War remain open and accessible as a platform until March 2019. After that all of the wonderful material that has been added by over 135,000 users will be shared with the Imperial War Museum and that will then act as a repository for all this wonderful material to be accessible for future generations. It's a digital resource that's going to be permanent it's not going to be a website that's going to go offline in two years' time and all that hard work will be lost. The fact that it's source-based, it gives a lot of credibility and a lot, a lot of plausibility to this. And I really think that in 
50, 60 years time, someone's doing their family history and they happen to put that name into lives and it turns out it's one that someone's researched without having a family connection, that would be so exciting to look at it and find a, an obscure newspaper that you never would have known to look for um, because someone's researched it from an entirely different angle. As a, a, an act of commemoration, um, I do consider that being a remote volunteer was, is probably the, one of the most rewarding things that I've done.